Hi everybody, I'm Dave. I'm the pastor at Grace Baptist Church in Ottawa, Illinois, and today is Good Friday. And I want to welcome you to our online community today and today's message, which talks about the events that happened on the day that Jesus was crucified. This is what we celebrate on Good Friday. And many of you are probably wondering why we celebrate the death of Jesus and why we call it good, as in Good Friday. And so in today's message, I will talk about why Good Friday is good, why we celebrate it as Christians, and I'll talk about the three most famous words and the three most important words that have ever been uttered in all of history, and that's the words that Jesus said at the very end of his crucifixion. Just before he died, the Bible says that he shouted the words, it is finished. And I'm going to talk about what Jesus actually finished when he died on the cross that first Good Friday over 2,000 years ago. Now, he accomplished many, many things, hundreds if not thousands of things, when he died on the cross. But in today's message, I want to talk about five specific things, reasons why each of you who are listening today and watching today can be thankful that Jesus did voluntarily and willingly give up his life on a cross at Calvary so many years ago. Today's message is titled, The Job Has Been Completed, and this is for Good Friday, April the 10th, 2020. Welcome everybody to our Grace Online community this Friday afternoon. Today I want to spend a few minutes talking about Jesus and what he did for all of us on the cross when we celebrate this day that's come to be known as Good Friday. What is it about Good Friday that we call it good? What's so good about Good Friday? I mean, isn't this the day that Jesus gets beaten and whipped and tortured and eventually dies on a cross and then is buried in a grave? What's so good about all of that? And what's the benefits to me and to all of you who are listening today as we look at the things that Jesus did? Here we are a couple thousand years after those events actually took place on that very first Good Friday. So let me start by reading you a passage of Scripture that comes from the Gospel of John. This is John chapter 19, verses 28 through 30. And this records what happened at the very end of the crucifixion, at the very end of Jesus' life. It says this, it says, Knowing that everything was now completed, and that the Scriptures would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I'm thirsty. Then after he was given a drink, he shouted, It is finished. And with that, he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. Now, I want you to quickly notice three things looking at that verse. First, I want you to notice that he did not say, I am finished. He says, it is finished. And the reason that he didn't say, I am finished, is because he wasn't finished. I mean, he came back to life three days later, and he's alive in heaven today. So Jesus was not finished himself. He didn't die permanently. And so he wasn't saying, I'm finished. He's saying, it's finished. So what is it? What did Jesus finish? And what's completed? And what job was done? And that's what I'm going to get to in a few minutes during the main portion of my message today. The second thing I want you to notice is that it says that when he said those words, it is finished, Scripture says that he shouted the words. He shouted the three words, it is finished. This is not a man who's just about to die and can barely get the words out. This is not a whimper of defeat by Jesus. This is a battle cry of victory. So he's not saying, oh, finally, that's over, and, and it's finished, and it's done. I made it to the finish line. No, he's... He's shouting those words, it is finished. It's a battle cry to everybody saying, I did it. I finished the job that I came to earth to do. It's a shout of victory, and it's definitely not a whimper of defeat. And then thirdly, notice that after that it says that then he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. So notice that Jesus voluntarily dies. Who murdered Jesus? Nobody murdered Jesus. He gave his own life, and he gave it voluntarily. So Jesus was not a martyr. 
Jesus is a savior. A martyr is somebody who dies for what they believe in and then somebody takes their life from them, but nobody took Jesus' life from him. He willingly gave it up. And if Jesus hadn't wanted to go to the cross, he wouldn't have gone to the cross. And if he hadn't wanted to die, he wouldn't have died. He willingly gives up his life for you and for me. Now, in history, there have never been three words more important than those three words that Jesus said when he said, it is finished. Never. Those are the three most important words in your life, whether you realize it or not. They're the three most important words in my life. And if Jesus Christ had not said those three words, if he'd not said, it is finished, we today would have no hope. And we have no purpose for our lives today. And we have no power for the problems that we face. And no peace in our hearts. And definitely no place in heaven. And no pardon for our sins. None of those things would be true if Jesus had not said, it is finished. I did it. I completed the job that I was given to do. Those are literally the most important words in all of history. And if you get that, then you get Christianity in a nutshell. That's what Jesus was all about. If you understand those words, it is finished. So what was it that he was actually finishing when he says it is finished on the cross? In the Greek, it is finished is just one word. It's the word tetelestai. And that literally means that if you'd been at the foot of the cross that day, you would have heard him shout, to telestai. That's the Greek word. You would have heard him shout that. And so that one word in the Greek means it's finished. It was a very common word in ancient times, and it was used by everybody. If you were a servant during Jesus' time, when you had finished all your work and finished all your jobs or your chores or your assignments, you'd come to your boss, your master, and you'd say, to telestai, or I've completed the work. It's all done. If you were a judge, to telestai was a legal term. And so a judge would bang a gavel, and when somebody had paid their sentence, or they served their time, they paid their debt to society, the judge would bang the gavel down, and he'd say, to telestai, which meant justice had been served. Your debt had been paid. Your deed to society had been taken care of. You served the time, to telestai. It's a legal term. They'd stamp it on your prison sentence, commuting your prison sentence, time served. You're a free man to tell us that. If you were an accountant, it was also an accounting term, and it literally meant paid in full. Archaeologists have found that word to tell us that on all kinds of documents. They stamp it on bills that have been paid. If you paid off your house, your mortgage would be stamped to tell us that. If you Paid your taxes, your tax bill to Rome would be stamped to Telestai. Paid in full, you've paid off your debt. If you were an artist, when you put the final touch on that painting or on that sculpture, and it's completely finished, it's all done, you would say to Telestai. The work of art is finished, it's complete, it's done. And if you were a priest and you were doing the sacrifices in the temple, at the end of that sacrifice, the priest would say, to Telestai, meaning that the offering had been made. Now, every one of those common explanations that I just gave you are all metaphors for the cross. And it's what Jesus was saying when he said, to Telestai. And it explains what Jesus actually finished. Now, I could give you a very long list of things that Jesus finished that day. For instance, in the Old Testament, there's about 380 prophecies where God says, I'm going to tell you that I'm sending a Savior, and He's going to save you from your sins. And here's how you're going to know that it's the real guy, it's the real Savior, it's the real Messiah. This is not a fake Messiah or a fake Savior. He gave 380 prophecies. Jesus fulfilled every single one of those 380 prophecies to tell us that. There's literally, in the Bible, there's literally thousands of promises from God to you, and the Bible says that Jesus fulfilled all of those promises to you. 
2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 tells us that all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ. And so I could literally, this afternoon, I could literally make a list of hundreds of things that to tell us die means when it means it's finished, when Jesus completed the work on the cross. But to understand the cross today, what I want to do is I want to just talk quickly about five things that Jesus finished on the cross. Five things that was finished when Jesus shouted the word to tell us die. Here's number one. Jesus paid my penalty and he canceled my debt on the cross. That's the first thing that happened. You see, God is a God of laws and a God of order. And this universe that surrounds us, I think all of us would admit, admit that it's, it's not chaos. It runs by certain laws. And God is the one that established all of those laws at the time of creation. The laws of physics and the laws of mathematics and the laws of biology and chemistry. God made all of these laws when he created the universe. He also created physical laws and spiritual laws, relational laws and moral laws. God gave us all of these laws and he expects them to be obeyed because those laws are in place to make your life work the way that it should work. To be the best that your life can possibly be, we need to follow the laws that God has given us. So there's all kinds of laws and they were all created by a loving and orderly God. But unfortunately, we've all broken the laws. Now, when you have laws, they're worthless, unless there's a punishment or a penalty when the law's broken. If anybody can break the laws and get away with it, that's just not fair. And so God's also a God of fairness and justice. He knows when things aren't fair, and He knows when things aren't right. Is, uh, is it right for people, as an example, is it right for people to get away with murder? No. I mean, we all know that that's not fair. Is it right for people to hurt you and not have any penalty for it? No. I mean, we all know that that's not fair. But there's the problem. God created all of these perfect laws that, as human beings, we're unable to keep them all completely. We all break the laws that God created all of the time, and the Bible calls that sin. And the Bible also says that there is a penalty for that. It says that the wages of sin is death. And that's the bad news. So God says because of that, someone has to pay because that's what's fair and that's what's just. And it's either you, the person who is the lawbreaker or the rule breaker, or somebody else. And so here's the good news. And I would even say it's the great news because God comes along and he says, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll just do it myself. I'll pay the penalty for you. I'll serve your time. I'll, I'll pay your debt for you. I'll do your wrath. I will take care of it so you don't have to. Romans chapter 8 in the Bible says this in verses 3 and 4. It says the law of Moses could not save us. And that's the Ten Commandments and all the laws of the Old Testament. The laws of Moses could not save us because of our sinful nature. But God put into effect a different plan to save us. He sent His own Son in a human body like ours, that's Jesus, and He gave His Son as a sacrifice for our sins. Jesus was perfect. He hadn't committed anything wrong, yet He died for our sins. And it says that God did this so that the requirements of the law would be fully accomplished for us who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead follow the Spirit. So, what's the requirement of the law? The requirement is fairness and justice. And God demands that. He demands fairness. It's not fair to break the law and get away with it. But God said, I'll do it myself. And Jesus died on that cross, on this day that we celebrate as Good Friday. Jesus died so you wouldn't have to pay for any of your sins. That's the gospel. That's good news. And that's what Good Friday is all about. So that's the first thing. Now look at these other couple of verses. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15. It says, Christ died to set people free from the penalty of the sins they committed under that first 
covenant, which is the laws that we were just talking about. So anything you've ever done wrong, and anything you ever will do wrong, Jesus paid for on the cross. So he not only forgave you, he not only paid your penalty, he completely wiped out your account. He, he wiped the record clean. Look at this next verse. Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. It says, God wiped out the charges. He, he canceled the charges against you. And it says he canceled the record of all of the times we've disobeyed God's commandments. So he canceled the record. It doesn't exist anymore. It's gone. And it says Jesus took our guilt on his body and nailed it to the cross. That, folks, is the good in Good Friday. That's what he came to accomplish. The first of many things that he came to accomplish. But he paid for all of your sins. And listen, like I mentioned just a second ago, he didn't just pay for the ones you've already done. He's paid for the ones you haven't done yet. Did you know that? And do you realize that? The ones that you're going to do later this afternoon or this evening or tomorrow or next week and, and the next years of your life, they're all already paid for. It is finished. To tell us I. It's not like he paid for some of your sins and not the ones in your future. Those have already been paid for too. It is finished. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, it says, After Jesus had finished his work, he finished the work that he did on the cross. It says, He became the source of eternal salvation for everyone who obeys him. And that's one of the benefits that makes Good Friday so good. That's number one. Here's number two. The second thing that Jesus finished on the cross when he said it is finished is this. He defeated the fear of death. In other words, none of us have to fear death anymore. Now today, with everything going on in the world around us, with the coronavirus, this pandemic, we're seeing death in some very high numbers today. And it's very real for people today. And because of this, people are scared. They're scared that they're going to get sick. And they're scared that they might die. So let me explain the second thing that Jesus did on the cross for you. We all know that death ultimately is universal, right? I mean, the mortality rate is 100% because we're all, at some time or another, we're all going to die. Nobody is going to live forever on this planet. And so only people who are foolish would go through life unprepared for something that we've known since the day we were born is going to happen. And we know this. We know that we're going to die. I'm going to die, and so are all of you who are listening today. We don't know how, and we don't know when, but none of us were meant to last here on this earth forever. We're meant to last forever, but just not here. So if we're all going to die, and we know it's all going to happen to everybody, why is it that we're so fearful about it? It's because, one reason is because we don't know what's going to happen unless you've read the Bible, and then you do know. Now, you don't have to fear death if you accept what Jesus did for you on the cross because once you do that, you're no longer afraid to meet God. If you've put your complete faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, you no longer have to fear death. Death. Some of us are afraid to meet God because of the way that we've lived our lives. And, and you know that you've got to explain a lot of things when you're standing in front of Him. But if you realize, I'm not going to have to do that. I'm not going to have to explain anything if I've trusted in Christ because He's paid for all my sins. Then it's just, you know, welcome. Welcome into this place that I've prepared for you. Let's start your eternity here in heaven. So there's no fear. Look at what the Bible says about this in Romans chapter 5, verse 17. It says, the sin of one man, that's Adam, he's the one that got us into all this trouble. It says, Adam caused death to rule over us, but all who received God's wonderful, gracious gift of righteousness will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. Or how about this next verse? 
Hebrews chapter 2, verses 14 through 15. It says, Jesus became flesh and blood by being born in human form. So God came in as a human from heaven to earth. And it says, for only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil, who has the power of death. Only in this way could he, Jesus, deliver those who have lived all of their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. You see, folks, when I know what God has planned for me, I'm not afraid of dying. And I haven't been afraid of dying for a very long time now. I'm ready to go at any point because I know where I'm going. Heaven is a better place. And I know what the Bible says about it. Here's what Jesus said in John chapter 14, verses 1 and 2. He said, Do not let your hearts be worried or fearful. Trust in God and trust also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms, and I'm going there to prepare a place for you. Now, if Jesus hadn't said those three words, it is finished, there would be no place for you or for me in heaven. You better be glad, all of us should be extremely glad that he said it's finished because one of the things that he did was he paid for our ticket, our way to get to heaven. And heaven is going to be some kind of place. I wish I had the time today to tell you about heaven, but you can't even imagine the perfection that waits on us there. I mean, if you think of all of the colors of this world and all of the beautiful places that exist on this world, none of it compares to the things that we're going to experience when we get to heaven. We only live in this world in three dimensions, but there's, there's dimensions that we don't even know about. So how incredible heaven is going to be, and he says God is preparing a room there for you and for me. So there's a place for you in heaven, so we don't have to be afraid, because I know as a believer in Jesus Christ, I know what lies in store for me when I take my last breath in this life. Here's a third thing that Jesus did on the cross that he finished. And this is a big one for day to day, right here, while we're here on this earth. And it's this. Jesus broke Satan's power to mess up our lives. Now, I don't know if you figured this out yet, but life, at times can be really hard, and I'm assuming you all have noticed that, right? I mean, life is hard. Life can be really difficult, and sometimes we feel like we're in a pretty big struggle. And so I'm, I'm certain all of us feel like we've been in a battle, and we're having to fight for everything, and we feel like we're in a war. Well, guess what? You are. There is a cosmic war that's going on between good and evil, between God and Satan. And we're pawns. We're sort of stuck in the middle of this battle that's going on. And that's why we get bumped back and forth and back and forth. God's got way more power than Satan does, but Satan is fighting. And he's always trying to mess up your life. Here's what the Bible says, Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. It says, God rescued us from the dark power of Satan and brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. Now, there's two ways that I want to share with you this morning, two ways that you need to know how Satan messes up your life. And he uses these two things in your life all the time. And those two things are temptation and condemnation. Those are the two tools that he primarily uses in your life and in my life, and they come through our attitudes. He can't force any of us to do anything, but what he can do is he can put thoughts in our heads, in our minds, and we don't have any defense if we don't have God's spirit in us. So he uses temptation, which means he's trying to lure every single one of us off the path to do something that's self-destructive, something that will hurt you, something that will hurt your relationships or hurt your family. And he's trying to tempt you all the time, trying to get you to mess up, to get off the plan, because he knows that it's going to hurt you. That's temptation. And then there's condemnation. He's always whispering in your ear, and he's always saying things like, Dave, you're, you're nothing. Dave, you're worthless. You, you don't matter. Nobody likes you. You're, you're never going to get married. You're never going to amount to anything. 
Your parents were right about you. You're, you're a failure. You're terrible. And on and on and on. And just constantly feeding all of those things to you. Now, I want you to understand this afternoon how, how that works. Before we commit some kind of thing that's wrong, before we break a law or break a rule and sin, here's what Satan does. He, he goes, he's whispering to you. And he says to start with, he said, hey, it's, it's no big deal. Now, come on, everybody's doing this. It's no big deal. And so he minimizes the things that he's tempting you with. But the moment that you give in, and the moment that you do it, he starts maximizing it with condemnation. He says things like, are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You just did that? You're never going to be forgiven for what you just did. Forget it. You think God is ever going to use you now? You think God is going to bless you? Tough luck. You know, forget it. And so he goes from minimizing things, saying it's no big deal, to maximizing it. That's, that's horrible. That's the unpardonable sin. There's no way that you'll ever get out of that hole that you just dug for yourself. And that's the way that he works. That's the way he works in your life, and that's the way he works in my life. But when you trust Christ, what Jesus did on the cross on Good Friday it does two things. He gives you the power to resist temptation, and He gives you the power to reject condemnation. And I'm talking about these mental thoughts that He puts in our minds every single day. So let me show you what the Bible says. First, because of the cross, I can resist temptation. We now have a new power. When we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we now have a new power that we didn't have before on our own. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 says, You can trust God now to not allow any temptation greater than your power to resist it. And so that means God will never allow more on you than He puts in you to bear it up, to bear up under those temptations. You can trust God to not allow any temptation greater than your power to resist it. And then it also says that when you're tempted, God will provide a way of escape so that you can defeat it. Because He wants us to win over Satan. So He gives us a new power that we didn't have before. You don't have to say yes to those things that He's tempting you with. You now have the power to say no. And then not only that, because of the cross, I can reject condemnation. I can stop that incessant, that never-ending flow of negative ideas that just keep coming into my mind about me, that's putting me down constantly. Jesus destroyed Satan's leverage to accuse you and to accuse me. The Bible says it like this in Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. It says, God took away Satan's power to accuse you of sin, and God openly displayed to the whole world Christ's triumph at the cross, where your sins were all taken away. So, how does he defeat Satan this way? Well, if you've had your penalty paid, and your debt has been forgiven, like we've already talked about, what is it that Satan can accuse you of now? I mean, if the account's not in heaven, if it's been wiped clean in heaven, if it's all been wiped out, there's nothing to accuse. Now, do you still mess up? Of course we do. I mess up all the time, and so do you. But when, when the devil comes, when Satan comes and starts to accuse me, then all I have to say is, what are you talking about? God's already forgiven it. He's forgiven it all. That one was paid for on the cross. Now, let me give you a couple more things that Jesus accomplished on the cross, and then we'll be done this afternoon. This one's fast because I'm going to emphasize the last one. But number four, on the cross, Jesus created a family for you. And that family is called the church. God wants all of us to be a part of His family. It's going to last forever. It's going to outlast the United States. It's going to outlast this whole world. It's the only thing on this earth that's going to last is the family of God. Everything else will one day be destroyed according to Scripture. Now, I want you to understand this because this is important. Before the cross, there were two groups of people talked about in the Bible. There were the Jews, who were God's chosen people, 
And then there's the rest of us. So all of us, whether you're from Asia or Africa or Latin America or Europe or the United States, we're all in this other group called Gentiles. So if you're not a Jew, then you're a Gentile. Now the Jews were called God's chosen people, and most of you have heard that. They were God's chosen people, but what was it that they were chosen to do? They were chosen to spread the good news about God to everybody else. But they failed at that. They didn't do such a good job on that one. And so God turned to the church. And God said, I want everybody to be in my family. I don't just want Jews in my family. I want everybody in my family, Jews included, but also Africans and Asians and Latinos and Europeans. I want everybody. And that happened because of the cross. Look at what the Bible says. This is Ephesians chapter 2, verses 14 and then 19. It says, Christ has made peace between Jews and Gentiles by making us all one family. So we're all in one family now when we put our faith and trust in Jesus. And it says, breaking down the wall of hostility that separated people. Now we are no longer considered foreigners or outsiders, but we can all be fellow citizens and members of God's family. So we're all included now. No matter what your racial background is, the ground is perfectly level at the foot of the cross. Jesus Christ belongs to everybody, and that's part of what makes Christianity so unique. Salvation belongs to everybody. It's why here at Grace we're against prejudice, we're against racism, we're against bigotry, because God has made us one family. And we say we want our church to look like heaven is going to look. So no matter what your background is, you're welcome here. And if you're in the Ottawa, Illinois area, after we're able to get back together again, I would encourage you to come and visit us here at Grace Baptist Church, because everybody is welcome here at Grace. Now... Here's the fifth thing. One more thing. The fifth thing that makes Good Friday good news is this. That on the cross, when Jesus said, it's finished, and this is a big one, He guarantees my salvation forever. I don't have to guarantee it. He guarantees it. I don't have to keep myself saved. He keeps me saved. It's not like you're going to be saved today, and then a couple of days later you're going to be lost again, and then a week after that you get saved again, and then maybe two months later you commit a sin, and you get lost again, and so it's like saved, lost, saved, lost, and, and you could maybe live a, a nearly perfect life or a nearly great life, and on the last day just do the wrong thing, and boom, you're going to hell. No, that's not it at all. Once you are saved, He guarantees your salvation forever. Eternity begins the exact moment that you put your hand in the hand of Jesus Christ and you say, God, I'm all in. I'm all in. So here's what the Bible says. Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. It says, you can be certain. And I want you to pay particular attention to that word. You can be certain. It's not a wish it's not a guess. It's not a I hope so. This is something that you can build your life on. It says you can be certain of this, that God who began His good work within you will continue His work in you until it's finally finished. Finally finished on that day when Christ Jesus comes back again. Because what God starts, folks, He finishes. God's not going to save you for a little bit and then let you go off in the ditch. Now, like I said earlier, you may mess up. You may lose some fellowship. You may lose some rewards. But you are a child of God at the moment that you become saved. And once a child is born into your biological family, they might go do all kinds of bad things. They might go and rob businesses. They might become a terrorist. But... They're still your child, no matter what. The fellowship between you may be strained because of the things that they've done, but they're still your child. You can't be unborn. And once you're born again, once you're saved, once you're part of God's family, you can't be unborn again. You're saved, and you're saved forever. The reason 
is because you're saved based on the merits of Christ, not on anything that we've done based on His merits. Now, I want you to follow me a little bit on the logic of this. Since if the way that I got to heaven, and there's a lot of people who believe this, but if the way that we get to heaven is by doing certain things and by being good, well, I'm a good person, I, I ought to be able to go to heaven. If that's the way we got to heaven is by being good and by having a pretty good record here, then obviously if I'm saved by those works, the moment that I stop working, I would lose my salvation. But you're not saved by what you do. You're saved by what Jesus did. It is finished. To tell us that. It's finished and there's nothing that you can add to it and there's nothing that you can ever take away from it. Your salvation was completed on that cross on that first Good Friday 2,000 years ago and you can't do anything about it. You can't lose it. You can't improve on it. Once you have salvation, you absolutely cannot lose it. Look at what the Bible says. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8. It says saving is all His idea and all His work. It's all God's idea. It's all His work. We don't do any work in salvation at all. All we do, it says, is trust Him enough to let Him do it. It's God's gift from start to finish. A gift, folks, is not something that you earn. A gift is something that's given to you that you don't deserve. And none of us deserve to be saved. I don't deserve to be saved. And you don't either. But it's a gift. It's a gift because of what Jesus did on the cross. So now, hopefully, you understand why it's called Good Friday. And this fifth reason is because you can't lose your salvation. It's finished. It's all been paid for. You see, folks, what I've been talking about this afternoon is the difference between do and done. And it's the difference between religion and a relationship with God. And I'll tell you, I could care less about religion. I'm not into religion at all. Religion is simply a list of do's and don'ts and rules and regulations and rituals. And every religion has a different list. What's on your list says you're that kind of religion. And this list says that you're this kind of religion. But that's not in the scriptures. It's not about rules or regulations or rituals. It's about a relationship. The difference is not do, 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 all these things. It's done already. It's finished. It's perfect. It's complete. It's Good Friday. And it's what the cross is all about. And we call that grace. So aren't you glad this afternoon that God isn't righteous and just only, but He's also a loving God? I would think that we should all be extremely glad about that. That He said, I'll take the wrath, I'll pay the penalty, paid in full, it's finished. Look at this verse, John 10, 28. The Bible says, I give them eternal life, Jesus says this, and they will never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. Listen, for all of you who are listening today, if you're going to be secure in life, you need a foundation of security on which you can build a solid life as a man or a woman or a young person. You need a foundation that's not going to move. It needs to be rock solid. You cannot build a successful life on sand, shifting sand. Things like the money that you make and the opinions of other people and a lot of other stuff. But this, the things that I'm talking about that happened on Good Friday, this is rock solid. If you're going to have real security, you've got to put your security in something that can never, ever be taken from you. If you put your security in your boyfriend, or your girlfriend, they can be taken from you. They can leave you. If you put your security in your bank account, it can be taken from you. If you put your security in your good looks, if you think you're handsome or beautiful, let me tell you something. You're eventually going to lose that, and it's probably going to happen much sooner than you think it will. If you put your security in how you look, 
That's not very secure. If you put your security in your husband or your wife, you can lose your spouse. If you put your security in your health, you can lose your health. Here's what real security is. It's putting it in something that can never be taken from you. I can lose my health. I can lose my wealth. I can lose my family. I can even lose my life. I can lose my mind. But I can't lose my salvation because it is finished. To tell us not. It's been paid for, and nothing is ever going to change that. I may really mess up. I may go off the deep end. But at one point in my life, when I said yes to Jesus Christ, Jesus says, you're in my hand. And nobody can take you out. Nobody is ever going to take you away. And that, folks, is good news. Now look at this verse, Acts 10, 25. It says, it makes no difference who you are, or where you're from, or I'll even say what you've done. It makes no difference. If you want God and are ready to do as He says, the Bible says, the door is open. So let me summarize, and then I'm done. Why is Good Friday good? And what did Jesus complete on the cross? Let me summarize these five things. He, he paid my penalty. He canceled my debt. There's not even any account in heaven against me anymore. There's nothing for God to charge against me. It's already been completely wiped out. Number two, he defeated the fear of death. I, I'm not afraid because I know Jesus is building a home for me in a beautiful, wonderful, perfect place called heaven. Number three, he broke Satan's power to mess up my life. And now I'm going to have a new power. And if you get God's spirit in you, now you can resist temptation and you can reject all the condemnation. We just don't have to listen to those things anymore. They're wrong. And they're all lies. He created a family to include me. And it's called the church. It's a family that gives me support and loves me. And then he guarantees my salvation forever. I'm sure that when Jesus got back to heaven, the Father said, well done, son. Well done. These are five things this morning that give us hope. And they're certain hope. These five things are something that you can build your life on. You can have security. So that no matter what happens with the stock market or the pandemic or the economy or anything else, I know these five things are absolutely secure. I may lose a lot of other stuff, but I'm never going to lose the love of God in my life. Nothing could ever separate me from His love. But what do I do? All I have to do is just accept it by faith. Jesus Christ as my Savior. Let's close with a word of prayer. Father, I want to thank you for what Jesus did for us on the cross on that very first Good Friday. I want to thank you, Lord, that my debt is paid, that I have a place in heaven. All the things that we talked about today, Lord, I know I'm absolutely certain in every single one of those things and it's all because of what your son Jesus did. Father, I pray for those who are going through life, and even maybe they're part of your family, they feel uncertain about things, and they're worried about things. Give them the peace and the security that only you can give, Lord. And I pray, Father, that if there's anybody today who's listening, who is not yet part of your family, that today will be the day that they make that decision, they will accept that free gift, and put their faith and trust in you. And you, Lord, will make them part of your family. I pray all these things this morning in Jesus' precious name. Amen. I want to thank you all for listening to today's message. And as I do with all of my messages, I would encourage you to go back and verify the accuracy of the things that you heard me speak about today. Uh, get your Bibles out and check all of the scriptural references that I gave. Make sure that those are all accurate. And then just check it out for yourselves. Go talk to somebody that you trust, another Christian, um, somebody that's knowledgeable on the things that I talked about, and just verify for yourself that everything that I shared with you today is true and accurate. I want to conclude today by talking to you about the most important decision 
that you'll ever make in your entire lives, and that's the decision about your salvation. We call it the gospel, which is the good news of Jesus Christ. And here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that every single one of us is born a sinner, that we're all sinners. It says that we're all sinners and that there's none righteous, not one. And so ever since Adam and Eve, all every person that's ever been born all throughout history has been born a sinner. And we, if we're being honest with ourselves, we all know this because we know that every single day we do things that are not right. And so we are all sinners. You and I are both sinners. The Bible also says that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so what that means is that because we're sinners, the wages or the debt that has to be paid for our sin is death. And death means an eternal separation from God in a place called hell. Now, he doesn't want us to spend an eternity there. He wants us to spend an eternity with him. And so the passage says that the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so God made a way, he made a provision for our sin debt to be satisfied. And the only way that that could have been satisfied was through his son, Jesus Christ. And so he sent his son to pay the sin debt for each and every one of us. The most famous passage of scripture is John 3, 16, that says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal or everlasting life. And so God loves us, all of us, so much that he sent his son to pay this debt so that we wouldn't have to be separated from him for all eternity. And so Jesus came from heaven. He lived a life here on earth, and then he was crucified. He died on a Roman cross, and he shed his perfect blood as the sacrifice or the payment for you and for me. And so he died and he was buried, and three days later he rose from the dead, and today he sits at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And so the Bible tells us that the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ because of what Jesus Christ did for us. So how do you get saved? Well, the way that you get saved, the way that you make that decision is it says that if you proclaim with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that he rose from the dead, you will be saved. And so we just have to make the decision to accept the free gift that God is giving us, this free gift of his son. We have to acknowledge who Jesus is, that he is God's son, that he did come to pay our sin debt, that he paid that debt on the cross, and that he rose from the dead three days later. When we acknowledge that, when we believe that, and then when we proclaim it, in other words, we tell somebody else about that decision that we've made, then the Bible says that we are saved. And so our eternal destiny then is set for heaven. We're sealed by the Holy Spirit and we are going to heaven because we have accepted the free gift of salvation. It is the most important decision you'll ever make. And, and my hope and my prayer is that if you have not made that decision, that you will continue to check it out and you will make that decision as soon as possible. It's a critical decision that we all need to make, and I hope that you will make it today.